Good morning. Welcome to New City Church. So glad to see you today. Hope you are doing well wherever you are. Let's worship together. You can rejoice with us. Sing. The psalmist said, Come, let us worship the Lord. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Yes and amen. You will do great things. Okay, come on, say, God, this is what you do. You do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. and I'm your host for today. If you're new to New City Church, we want you to feel at home. If you have questions or prayer requests, people are available to chat with you on whatever platform you're watching. You can also reach out by texting us at the number below. Our goal is to help you know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. So wherever you're at in that journey, we are excited to walk with you. You can always find more teaching, information, and ways to connect with New City at our website, newcity.life. And if you take a few seconds to like, share, and subscribe to New City content, you'll make it easier for you and others to find us. Last week at New City, we said that whatever we are worried about, 
God is already working on. This is great news, and it's why we can worship God with our whole hearts, even in difficult times. Whatever challenges, disappointments, or uncertainties that you're facing today, God's purposes and plan for your life is secure. So for a few more minutes together, let's set aside our anxieties and concerns, and let's rejoice in God's overruling grace that is at work in every one of us. God bless you as you worship today. That's right. We're grateful today for His love. The Bible says that there is no beginning or end to that love, and so we are grateful today. We can sing about it. We can rejoice in it. We can be secure in it today because it didn't depend on us in the first place. So let's sing it together. Your love's so great. Your love's so great. Jesus in all things. I've seen a glimpse of your heart. Million years. Still I'll be singing. How can I praise you in love? Can I praise you enough? Now sing it with me. You are the Lord. You are the Lord Almighty. I'm shining on the stars in glory. Your love is like the wildest ocean. Oh, nothing else can fail.
bless you, Lord, today. Nothing else compares to who you are. We thank you, Lord, that when we have you, we have what we need. You are our sufficiency. We look to you today, Lord, for who you are. It's just in your nature, God, to be good. It's just in your nature to be loving. You are love. You are goodness. And so we worship you today, God. And we recognize, Lord, that in positioning ourselves in this way, God, Lord, it's the right, it's the right posture for us to take to declare who you are and to delight in it, Lord. You are here moving in our midst I worship you I worship you You are here working in this place I worship you I worship you You are here Moving in our midst, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, working in this place, I worship you, yes I worship you, you are rainmaker, miracle worker. Promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Come on, say who he is today. He is way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, searching every I worship you, I worship you, you are here, hearing every heart, I worship you, I worship you. Stop working. You 
never stop, you never stop working. You said, even when I don't see it, you're working. That's what Ephesians even says. When I don't feel it, you're that working. our God is working furiously to bring his purposes about in our lives, in his working. church, in the world. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never Say stop that, even working. When. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. You are way maker, miracle worker. bless you today for who you are God it's not that we're looking to you to do something Lord today it's enough for us to acknowledge who you are because everything you do comes from who you are you are love you are goodness you are way maker you are miracle worker the one who keeps every promise who is truth and so we bless you today and we love you today God I pray God for every heart that is discouraged for everybody who be watching today and a part of this service today who would need to be reminded of who you are. God, that you never fail at doing these things because you never change in who you are. So be blessed and be worshiped today, God, we ask in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen, amen, and amen. God bless you today. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Hallelujah. Welcome again to New City Church. This Wednesday, New City Youth will launch Wednesday nights at Heininger Hall on the campus of North Central College. This is an amazing spot to meet, and it's going to be the perfect setting for junior high and high school students to connect and grow, so spread the word. We have lots of outdoor space for fun and lots of indoor space to social distance, so plan on an awesome time together. If you're a student or you know a student who might like to grow in friendship with God and with others, head to our website to get all the information that you need. If you're a parent with elementary aged kids or younger, we want to invite your children to join in on the fun with New City Kids. Every weekend we have something new for our juniors and all-stars ages 6 and under, as well as for legends ages 7 through 11. Even through pandemic, our amazing New City Kids team has continued to walk kids through the great stories of the Bible, helping them understand how every one of these stories points to the good news of Jesus. If there's something that we can help you with as a parent or answer questions about New City Kids, don't hesitate to reach out to us at kids at newcity.life. Every week, we hear more stories of people whose lives are impacted by the ministry of New City Church from compassion outreach to discipleship in small groups to this worship service online. None of this would be possible without the faithful prayers and financial support that you bring. It isn't the amount of giving that matters as much as the heart and attitude that inspires it. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9 that each person should decide in their heart what they should give, not reluctantly or under pressure, because God loves a cheerful giver. And then it says that God is able to bless you abundantly so you can abound in every good work. That's our prayer today, that God would bless you abundantly so you will excel in blessing others. Now, let's prepare our hearts for God's word.
Good morning, everybody, and God bless you. Thank you for being with us at New City. Uh, we're really excited. Um, in the midst of this really crazy time, uh, we still see God doing some wonderful things. And so uh, that's really important that we acknowledge that and that we remember that and encourage each other with that. Um, last week, we had a really neat uh, experience. We had what we called, a, our, we had a watch party weekend, which we have watch parties going on every, day, every weekend in different, some different locations, different homes, but we actually set aside some venues uh, where we could do that here on the campus in North Central College. And so we had people kind of uh, gathered in some different places. And the general feedback that I got from people was, wow, it was better than I thought, meaning um, the experience uh, felt safe and was engaging and was really nice. They kept talking, it's just so nice to be around people. So we're going to do that again. We wanted to do it one weekend and evaluate and see how things were. And it's our plan to kind of get back to that in, uh, in short order and create some more opportunities for that where we can safely gather um, but have some times where we can actually be together uh, worshiping and enjoying uh, not just the sermon content, right? But, uh, but it's really about the worship together. It's really about the opportunity to encourage each other. And uh, even see, I'll tell you, we had some folks in the auditorium where I was speaking, and it was so nice to be able to see people and to preach to people. Um, and I didn't really know if my jokes were landing because I couldn't really see very well, you know, behind the masks and stuff like that. But uh, I imagined, as I do every week, that I was very hilarious during that time. Um, and so, anyway, I'm very excited about that. I'm also pumped about this Wednesday night. We kick off a new season of New City Youth. And uh, while we are there in, at Heininger Hall on the campus of North Central uh, from 7 to 8.30, the pre-party begins at 6. Uh, I want to be there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with the kids this Wednesday night. And it's just going to be, we have a new home week in and week out um, for New City Youth, which is really fun on Wednesday nights. And then I have a very exciting, very exciting announcement today. Um, uh, most of you will know Pastor Jovan Ramos. He has been our guest several times uh, here as a speaker. But uh, Pastor Jovan and Amy Ramos and their family have accepted our invitation to come on staff and to be a part of our pastoral team here at New City. And so we are really excited. Uh, there, what a lovely family. There are three beautiful kids, Charlotte, Benjamin, and Cameron. Um, they're going to be moving up here in uh, next month sometime. And so we are very excited about that. Pastor Jovan, uh, you know, is a, is a great speaker great communicator, but uh, what you haven't had a chance to see is uh, what a phenomenal leader he is, and uh, it's very exciting uh, for, for me uh, to be able to have them be a part of our team. And so, man, we're excited to announce that and really looking forward to getting them started here and you getting to know them better. Um, we are in the final week of this series, Dear Church, and I'm going to bring it, uh, bring the word today from the last chapter of Philippians. Uh, last week, we talked about the beginning of chapter 4. This week, we're talking about the end of chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles and you want to turn to Philippians chapter 4, you can do that. Or if you're a regular with us, you know that you can just cheat and look at the screen. All right? So that's what we're going to do. The Apostle Paul says this, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content in whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through Him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out for Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more would be credited to your account. I've received full payment, and I have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you today for your word. It is a lamp for our feet, a light for our path. I pray that as we receive it today, that you would add your blessing to it and that you would, by your Holy Spirit, quicken it to our hearts, that it would have an impact in our lives and it would change 
who we are, how we see things, how we think. Lord, let there be a transformation that would take place, a shifting that would take place in our hearts and lives as we receive your word in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen and amen. That's the fun pastor way to say it. Amen and amen. Jesse and I uh, got away for a few days this past week to celebrate our five-year anniversary. Um, we, got, we got married in Colorado, and so we thought it would be great to go back to Colorado and spend some time there. And so uh, we did that. We were in uh, now summertime in Colorado. There's not um, we, we we stayed at a, like a ski place on purpose because it's cheap and it was um, empty. And so, but when you're there, the, the thing that you do is you just go hiking, right? And I'm not, I, I like hiking and I enjoy it. Um, I, it's basically, you know, you take a walk around in the woods and, you know, it's refreshing and we were at altitude, pretty high altitude. And so it was, it was fun. But um, what, I, what, I was, what I was really questioning though were the people that were, as we were hiking, the, you know, occasionally you'll be hiking around a, a park or something and you'll see people kind of hiking past you and they've got like their backpacks on and it's jammed full of stuff and, you know, they're out there with their tents and, and things and I'm thinking, you know, I like the fact that when I walk around in the woods, I'm going to go back to my same bed over here. I don't know why you have to carry your bed somewhere else to go sleep over there. That makes no sense to me at all. It isn't exactly what now people are like. Oh man, you gotta you gotta love you gotta love camping. It's it's my, it was a total tra- it's a tradition. Camping is a tradition in my family, and I'm like you know camping was a tradition in every family until we invented the house, and then we leveled up and decided, no, hey, let's go ahead and, uh, you know, let's, let's build a bathroom here, and let's use it, you know, and just kind of come back to that, right? That's, that seems like a great thing to me, but the reason I don't like camping very much is because uh, I, I get uncomfortable. I had some uncomfortable experiences camping, and being comfortable is a powerful motivator for all of us, I think, Right? That's what makes the text that, I'm, that I read to you really stand out, I think, is that the Apostle Paul here in this text is saying, I have found the secret to being content in every situation, whether I am hungry or whether I am well-fed, whether I am in plenty or whether I am in want. He says, I have learned how to be content in every situation, which is kind of an amazing thing. What, a, what an incredible secret. The good news is that Paul says, I learned it, which means that if he learned it, we can learn it too right? There's a guy named David Rubenstein. He's the founder of Carlyle Group. It's uh, one of the most famous and successful private equity firms in the world. Now, I, I, I was looking at this recently. I wanted to be up to date. I think that they manage somewhere around $225 billion worth of assets, right? That's a lot of money. And David Rubenstein in particular is worth um, $3.4 billion on a personal level. Now, that's an absurd amount of money. Now, when asked uh, in this interview, I was li- li- uh, listening to this interview uh, with David Rubenstein, and the interviewer kind of, uh, they were kind of going over the course of his career. He was looking back at his success and uh, what he's able to do now, and the interviewer asked him a really in- interesting question. They said, what would you give now as you are, you know, kind of getting up in years, what would you give, how much would you pay for an additional one year of life? Isn't that interesting? Great question. And David Rubenstein's answer was even more telling. He said this. He said, I would give it all up. $3.4 billion. He's, and the, the interviewer said, really? You're sure you would give it all up? He said, absolutely. I would start all over for one more year. I thought, what a fascinating what a fascinating answer. Because it's interesting, we spend our time reaching for hundreds and thousands of dollars, and we really kind of maybe undervalue the time that we're spending sometimes. Maybe we might be paying too much if one year is worth $3.4 billion. Now, I hope that as we talk about Paul and as we talk about this text today, that we can actually kind of get a glimpse into how Paul found contentment in his plenty and in his want. Because most of us are reaching for more all the time, and the question is, how do we actually find contentment with our situation, whatever it might be? Now, this is challenging. Most people don't, I mean, I guarantee that this is not a favorite topic for people for me to preach on, but as I've kind of followed the text and let the book of Philippians speak to us, this is where we're at. It's basically, here we are in the midst of pandemic, here we are in the midst of a difficult season uh, uh, and on so many levels and in so many different ways, so how then can we find contentment right now 
wherever we are and whatever our situation is. Well, here is the first point for those of you who are taking notes. Number one, the secret to this is in the source. The secret is the source. Paul used a word that the philosophers of his day would have used to talk about when he uses that word contentment in that Greek. And it, literally, the Stoics would have used that word to talk about self-sufficiency. But Paul does this interesting thing, which he frequently does, which is he kind of takes that word and he twists it to create a new meaning out of it because what he is not talking about, he's not talking about self-sufficiency. He's actually saying, I've learned the secret of being sufficient, being overflowing in my life, but it doesn't come from me. It comes from a different source. The secret is the source where does my provision come from, right? Where does my provision come from? That's a simple question to ask. I was at the grocery store this weekend, and um, th- there I walked by, and there was a woman who was upset talking to somebody about how she had just lost $200 in cash, $200 in cash. So I stopped, you know, to talk with her a little bit, encouraged her, and then I decided, hey, I'm going to help her out a little bit, and I'm going to give her like $40 in cash, so I gave the $40 in cash, and I never, I never really have cash on me, except for just minutes earlier, I had found $200 in cash walking in the store. And I just, okay, this is not a true story at all, right? But this is basically an illustration to say how a lot of us are. We feel really great, you know, like, oh, wow, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help somebody out, or I'm going to give uh, and be generous uh, and give to God, and I'm going to give back in this way, and we forget where it came from in the first place. How silly would it be for me to say, oh, here you are, miss, here's, your, here's $40, I hope you, you know, don't worry, you don't have to pay me back, when it's clearly obvious that it was her, it, hers in the first place. This is what we're talking about when we start talking about the idea of our source, because so many f- people, I think, feel like saints almost when they're generous to somebody else, and they give, and they forget that that wasn't theirs in the first place, right? They say, well, I did, you know, I, I earned this with my talent, and I earned this with my hard work, and absolutely, I'm not discounting your talents or your hard work, but where did that come from? Where did the opportunities, where did the talent, where did the gifts, where did the intelligence, where did it come from? It all came from the hand of God. He's the source, and so if we want to be content, we need to recognize who our source really is. Some time ago, I was preparing for a sermon series, and as I didn't really kind of like, this wasn't my idea, but in the end, I ended up reading through everything that Jesus said about money. Because actually I was looking for the right text that I wanted to preach from and and I was just kind of reading through it and ended up being, I went through everything and I realized Jesus talks more about money than any other single topic in the Gospels. 16 parables, 16 teachings that Jesus gives that mention money and many of those are parables and I realized this, in every one of the stories that Jesus tells about money, it is always the character with which we are supposed to identify is always managing somebody else's money. It's always somebody who's managing resources for somebody else. And clearly, Jesus is trying to make the point as he's teaching that what you and I have in our lives, whatever we have been given, is not actually ours. We are not owners. We are managers, right? We are stewards. We're the ones who are caretakers. And here's the thing. If you're managing somebody else's money, you don't need to feel guilty about the money that you manage. You just need to do it well, right? It belongs to somebody else, and so we're just stewarding it. That means if you've been given a little, that's not yours. You don't need to feel guilty about that. You just manage it. But if you've been given a lot and blessed greatly, this is my point. There's no need to feel guilty about that. Just manage it wisely because it's not yours anyway. Money is meant to be managed, not to manage us. And many of you, like me, have been in situations and seasons in our lives where we felt like we were being managed by our money. (laughs) Right? Where we felt like we were, you know, kind of uh, serving the, 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 the bills that we had to pay and the resources that we needed to get. And, and, and the bottom line is money should be managed, not manage us. Money can serve us, but if we make it our master, it will be a very harsh master. I find that money is neither good nor evil. Resources, money, you name it, whatever we're talking about, dollars, however you want to kind of, kind of uh, talk about this, it's neither good nor evil. And we could look at people, we could say, well, they got rich and then, you know, they got, it corrupted them. No, it didn't. What money actually does is wealth will actually amplify our strengths and our weaknesses, right? 
it will dial up our strengths and our weaknesses. That means if, you are a corru- if you've got a weakness in your heart, if you've got a character flaw, then, then money is going to empower you to make that character flaw even more visible. But if you have a strength in your character, if you're a compassionate person, money is going to actually help you to amplify that compassion toward other people. Right? So some people look at this as, well, I don't, you know, th- there's, no, there's nothing positive or negative to be said about wealth or money like that. It's simply an amplifier in our lives. When we are blessed, it's our job to recognize again who our source is. Jesus says this. He says, you can't serve two masters. You can't serve God or money. And I'll bet you most of his listeners did not expect him to say money. <laughs> right? But right there when Jesus says this, He says, money for just about every one of us is the chief competitor for our heart and our loyalty. Everybody runs the risk of making money their ultimate pursuit or their ultimate concern. And they can do it for the sake of being of comfort. They can do it for the sake of security. They can do it for all kinds of reasons, but that's the risk we run. And Paul, that's why what Paul says in this text is so countercultural because he says, how do I live then in contentment? He says, I start, because I, recognize, I start with recognizing God as my source. Now the real question of God's authority and his lordship in our lives does not boil down. It doesn't really find expression in our lives when we're in a place where we feel out of control and maybe where we're not able, you know, where there's a sickness or there's uh, some other issue where we, we're struggling to make ends meet or there's uncertainty about our futures. That, that's not the place where his lordship really, uh, you know, matters in our lives. It's, it's, the, it's the areas where we can control where his lordship finds expression. It's the areas like money and resources and priorities and where we direct the efforts of our lives. That's where his lordship really finds expression. Paul says, I'm happy with a little and I'm happy with a lot. He doesn't seem to be burdened by trying to find just the right amount to have. And I think that Christians, sometimes we, we do that. And it's so interesting because if you're a person who is, is moving between cultures, you'll see that people's idea about what is just enough is different, right? The idea somehow that we can have a just the right amount is not what Paul is saying. He says, I, I can have a little bit or I can have a lot and I can be content with it. It's like a Goldilocks lie that there is just a right amount to have. And this is what I find. The reason that's a problem is because for most of us, just the right amount is just a little bit more than what we have right now. <laughs> And for a lot of people, too much is anything more that somebody else has than me. <laughs> Make sense? I think that, that that's, a, that's a fallacy, that's a lie that we need to reject because the Bible is saying, just recognize God as your source. Whatever God has given me, Paul says, I'm going to work with. Because I can be content with a little, I can make that work. He says, or I can be content with a lot, and I can make that work too. So the question really is, who is your source today? That's the real secret. Number two. The plan is to partner. The gifts that the Philippians had sent to Paul, these offerings that they had brought to Paul to support his ministry, they were the expression of like a long-term commitment and relationship between these two. Paul says, you Philippians were the first to partner with me. And then I love this. He says, not just once, but over and over and over again, you were supporting me. And this is the part that really struck me. I've never thought of this before, but he says, when I set out from Macedonia, you guys were the only ones. And I just thought, man, it must stink to be the other churches who for all of recorded history since that time have now been, you know, remembered as the stingy ones, right? None of them, he says, none of you all, none of you all helped me out. But these Philippians, they did. And so he he is thanking them. That's what this letter, that was the occasion for this letter to say thank you for their continuing support. This long-term relationship and their support of his ministry and what God had called him to do, he's saying thank you. Now, I want to say again, as a church, we sink or swim based on the faithfulness of God's people. Right? Well, there's no other, there's no other plan. There's not a plan B. It's just we literally, and I like that. I mean, I know that in the future and at different times, there could be wonderful revenue models that church may, churches may stumble into. There could be, you know, innovations like that. But the bottom line is, I believe that it's God's purpose for us as God's people to support his work and to be generous. 
That's why I think every dollar that comes in uh, here as a church, every dollar that comes in uh, gets devoted to God's work. And, and, and we tithe off of that money. So every dollar that get, gets given, we actually give 10 cents out of that dollar and set it aside to support ministries outside of New City Church. That's our way of keeping this thing going and of continuing to be a blessing. Paul com- commends the Philippians because he says, nobody else gave but you, but that didn't stop. You weren't worried about what everybody else was doing. And I, 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 this isn't in my notes, but I'll just tell you quite honestly, I've been in church long enough and I've seen how, how patterns in, in giving go and the bottom line is there are people who give and they give over and over and over again and then there are people who don't give and they tend to not give, not give, not give, <laughs> right? And it's a good thing, Paul says to the Philippians, I'm glad that you, didn't, you weren't worried about what somebody else was doing because, because the fact that you weren't worried meant that you didn't say, hey, well, they're not pulling their way. Why this is the bottom line. Paul says, you just worry about you, and that's what you did. And it's the sincere love of the Philippians for the apostle Paul that made them want to give. They considered it a joy to share with him and the calling God had put on his life. And so not only did they share, in a sense we could call them shareholders in Paul's ministry, in his calling, and even in his troubles. He says, you shared with me in my troubles. You were willing to be there to help bear that burden up. It's pretty awesome. One of our our core principles here at New City is, is this. Generosity is our privilege. We say it over and over again. It's more than a saying for us because we really actually believe, I I really do believe that we are more blessed when we give than when we get. I really do. I believe that one of the next steps for some people here today, some people watching today, is is that as you are growing in your apprenticeship with Jesus, as you are growing as a Jesus follower, one of your next steps is going to be to become a giver. Because giving does this thing where it moves us from being, watch this, it moves us from being a shopper to being a shareholder, right? Because shoppers are really interested in what's the best deal I can get and what's it going to do for me. And it's, it's the, it's the uh, expression of a consumer mentality to say, I am, I, I just, you know, what, what can God do for me? And, and here's what's going to happen. As you follow Jesus, there's going to be these challenges that are going to come to your life to say you need to move from being a shopper and a consumer to being a shareholder and an investor in what God is doing in the world today. Generosity is our privilege because we are more blessed when we give than when we get. And Paul says it like this. He says, this really isn't about you guys adding to my account. It isn't what you put into my account. Paul says, what I'm really interested in and what's really happening here is what God is going to add to your account as you give. And that's what I want you to see here. That when we give, what actually happens is our account gets added to There is a fullness that comes into my life and I've experienced it as as there have been seasons where I have been stretched in my giving, where there have been seasons where I've been stretched in my faith and faithfulness to God. And there, there has been an incredible blessing that's come my way where my account has been added to as I have given faithfully to the Lord. I mean, I I I would preach about it, but you know, this happens to us preachers too. We talk about stuff and then when we live it and it happens, we're like, oh, it really works. You know, we took it by faith, we're talking about it, but over and over again in my life when this happens, I'm delighted and amazed that God continues to bless and add to our account, even though it seems like our our account should be less. Now, that's just how God works. Years ago, I had a friend asked if we could get breakfast, and so we, we got together for breakfast one morning, and he had been laid off of his job and had been looking for work for some time then. I think it was a period of months, and um, he was really, we talked all around that stuff and how things were going and, you know, we, we had a nice breakfast together and then we were leaving and, and then when we got into the parking lot, before we, right as we were about to get in our cars, he asked me a question. And For those of you guys who do this a lot, you know, you'll recognize that sometimes the whole per- point and purpose of a lunch meeting or a, a, a breakfast meeting can happen in the parking lot afterwards because that question was the whole point, I think. What was really on his mind came out he said hey I have one more thing to ask Um, he's like my severance is going to run out and I'm wondering here because I don't know what we're going to do mortgage I don't know what we're going to do all this stuff do I still need to tithe and I was like oh wish he didn't ask me that because I didn't 
I don't know, I, I don't, you know, nobody wants to say, but I, I didn't think I'd be a friend if I wasn't honest with him. I didn't think I'd be a friend. I didn't think I'd be a good pastor if I didn't tell him the truth. But the problem I, was I didn't want it to seem self-serving, you know, like, hey, yeah, you, you know, here I'm at the church and you should give to the church. But the bottom line is I said, listen, I think that it matters more now than ever before that you give to God what belongs to God. And I saw his face kind of fall and I could tell he was disappointed because I think he wanted somebody to let him off the hook, somebody official, you know, like myself. And hey, you're good, you're good. But I, I said, I said I, I'm sorry. I, I really think that this is when it matters most. And he's like, okay. Now, I can tell you, it didn't change my situation for him to give. I was taken care of. It didn't change. I didn't even know how much he gave. I didn't know, I didn't know how much he made. I had no, no, no insight into any of that. Didn't know any of it. Didn't ask about any of it. But it was just weeks later that he called me, and he was so excited on the other end of the line, and he said, listen, I just got a job offer uh, for a job that, that I, I, he's like, I, I did what you said. I, I continued to give, and I just got this job offer for a job that pays better, that has more room for growth and advancement, and was better situated for my whole family. He was like, this is amazing. Praise God. Now, my situation wasn't changed by that at all. But I could say that when he faithfully followed through on the commitments that God had put in his, I'll tell you what happened is that he was added to and God took care of him. We remember who is our source and how we're supposed to partner. I, I never, if he had been tight-fisted, he would have missed out on a lesson about partnership and provision that was worth more than the money that he gave. This September, we're gonna launch a number of new small groups. We're going to do some men's groups. We've got watch parties here for Sunday morning worship. Uh, but we're also going to start a new round of, of this, this uh, small group called Financial Peace. Now, Financial Peace is a program, the Dave Ramsey program, and it basically has to do with helping you get a grip on your finances, right, and learning how to manage your money instead of your money managing you like we talked about. For most of us, the, any of the financial pressures that we face, a lot of times it has less to do with how much we make and more to do with how, much we're, man, how we're managing it, right? And so this is great because it teaches, it teaches you how to do that well, and I want to encourage you. It's a great next step, and you can kind of keep your, you can kind of keep your ears open for, for how to join one of those small groups, and we're going to do it virtually, and you'll have a chance to kind of interact in that way, which is really great. Now, when you learn the secret of trusting God as your source, what follows is financial freedom. I really believe that. Some of you, part of your discipleship journey is not just going to be about getting rid of some of the sin patterns in your life and, and stepping into, you know, God's purposes in different ways. It's actually going to include financial freedom because learning to be free financially, learning to manage your money well creates a feedback loop of blessing in your life where you get blessed so that you can be a blessing and you get blessed so that you can be a blessing and you become a shareholder in God's work in places and with people that you literally never would have been connected to had you not learned how to be giving from a place of financial freedom. The secret is the source. The plan is to partner. And number three, the goal is God's glory. Paul concludes everything by saying this is all to the glory of the Father. There is, uh, in the Olympics, I think it's, it's uh, the Summer Olympics, there's a sniper competition. And uh, it's ironic, I think, that you have a, you know, an event like the Olympics that's dedicated to goodwill between nations. And then we say, well, let's see who can shoot something with the rifle this far. This is great, you know. But the, the idea is that, um, you know, the, the sniper competition, these athletes are actually pretty amazing because what they're able to do is when, when, when they are aiming, they actually can track their heart rate and slow it down. So it's been shown they actually slow their own heart rate down as they're getting ready to fire, and they will fire between heartbeats because that heartbeat could actually affect their aim. That's incredible, right? Well, this guy named Matthew Emmons was considered the best in the world, and I, I, didn't, I didn't write it down here, but he was, I think it was early 2000s, one of the Olympic Games in the early 2000s. He was considered the best in the world at the 50-meter three-target competition. So he had dominated the competition up until that point, and he had his final shot, which was to win the gold medal. And to win the gold, he had already scored well enough to where all he had to do was hit the target. Didn't have to get a bullseye, just had to hit the target anywhere, and he was going to win the gold. And so he did, he drew up his aim, he took his shot, and not only did he hit the target, but he got a bullseye. The problem was, he hit the wrong target. 
it's one of these Olympic legends, one of these stories that's gone down in history because when he actually drew up to aim for the target, he actually aimed at the wrong target and got no points and did not get the gold medal. And I think isn't it incredible for us to think that there are people in our lives, there are all kinds of people who are, who are hitting a bullseye in life but just at the wrong target, right? They're aiming for the wrong thing and they're hitting it great but they get no points. C.S. Lewis said this, aim at heaven and you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you'll get neither. Paul said, my secret is that I can do all things through Jesus who's my source. You Philippians, you're my partners in this, but let's be clear, the real aim here is the glory of God. The real aim here is God's purposes to exalt his name in the earth and to bring redemption to his creation. This is the vision that sustained Paul through every uncertainty and every difficulty in his life. This was the aim that was informing his ambitions, his decisions, his priorities. The glory of God. In Luke 5, there's a story where Peter, James, and John have been fishing all night. They bring their boats in and they're cleaning up their nets and disappointed because they've caught nothing. And Jesus is now at this point where he's kind of against the, the lake of Gennesaret and there's these uh, crowds of people pressing against him. So he turns to Peter and he says, Peter, I, I want to use your boat as a pulpit. So if we could just push out a little bit, I'd appreciate that. And so Peter lets him use his boat. And when Jesus is done teaching, we don't even get the content of his sermon at all. When Jesus is done teaching, he comes back to Peter and he says, Peter, why don't you put out and, and let your nets down out there and see if you don't catch something. And Peter says, listen, Jesus, you, you stick to the preaching and I'll stick to the fishing. Because this is his profession. He's like, I know what I'm doing. I've been doing this. And I see that happen in the church all the time. People are like, you know what? Uh, I, I, kinda, I got this thing. I got it. I know what I'm doing here. Well, God, you know, this whole idea of, of giving the first tenth of, 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 of what I earn to God, I, you know, that seems like a little bit, that seems like a little bit extreme. So why don't you let me manage it myself? But this is, what, this is what was great about what Peter said. Is Peter said, but because you say so, Lord, I'll do it. And so then he, he and his partners, they put out from the land and they let down their nets. The Bible says that they have such a catch of fish that they have to call in a whole other boat to help them haul in the nets. And when they get back, you can tell Peter knew what this was because the Bible says that Peter falls at Jesus' feet and says, away from me, Lord, I'm a sinner. And then Jesus does this thing, which is really awesome. He's so good at doing this with us. Is he, 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 doesn't, he doesn't say, yeah, you're right. You're a sinner, Peter. He says, hey, Peter, if you think that catching fish like this was great, follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. And in one statement, in one invitation, Jesus blows up this small vision that Peter had for his life. I'm just going to take this business, the family business, and we're going to try and make the money that we can, take care of the kids, make sure that we, you know, pass it on to the next generation. Jesus says, you know what, that's good, but I've got something grander. I really believe that part of what many of us need to understand is that God's glory, having an aim for God's glory, opens up our vision to be so much wider so much grander, so much greater than it would be if we were to simply keep our heads down doing our stuff. We said it last week, if you want peace, don't close your eyes to your problems. If you want peace, open your eyes to God's provision and God's goodness. It's not that our vision is, we're taking it, oh, I can't look at that. It's not that. It's our vision is always too small. Here's the thing, if you don't have a vision for where your resources should go, inevitably, inevitably, it's gonna be your appetites that eat up all your resources. If you don't decide where your resources, your money, your time, your talent, wherever, if you don't know where that should go, then all that's gonna happen is your appetites are gonna end up consuming all of those resources. Nobody ever says, I really hope my life is just about stuff. It's just that at the end of some people's lives, they realize, oh, all I've really done is get a, accumulate a bunch of stuff. 
Nobody ever says that that's what they want to do, but they just do it because they didn't have a bigger vision for their life than just stuff. They didn't have a bigger vision for their stuff, their, their life than just comfort. They didn't have a big, bigger vision for their life than just security. And so in the end, it ends up that they live with a small vision. And today I want to challenge you that your next step might be to, to, to open your eyes to a grander vision of aiming for God's purposes through you and through others as you participate in what God is doing. And here's the thing. Grander visions have greater price tags. Grander visions have greater price tags, but nothing will make you more alive and present in your life than when you decide to follow Jesus in faith and make him your source and partner in what God is doing in the world and aim for God's glory. That's what's going to change your vision. So Philippians 4, Paul concludes and says, my God is going to meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. So to God our Father, to our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. I love that he says it like this because I know it was on Paul's mind. Our God is able to meet all of our needs. And I know that in this instance, in this context, he's talking about our practical, physical needs. But I know Paul would have seen it this way. The most significant provision that God has made is for forgiveness and grace to our lives. The brokenness and the broken relationship that has come between us and our Heavenly Father because of our sin, because of my sin, God has made provision for it. That's my most fundamental need is to be reconciled to my Heavenly Father because if that relationship is broken, then everything else is off kilter. And so Paul says, my God can meet all of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. And this is the thing. If you have not yet experienced that provision of forgiveness and grace in your life, I would say that is the most fundamental starting point for you today to be reconciled to your, to your heavenly Father. It's only possible. It is possible because of what Jesus has done for you. The Bible says... That when he went to the cross, he was sinless and innocent, but he paid the price for our sin and our guilt. He bore up our punishment, and by his wounds, the Bible says, we are healed. If you haven't received that grace today, this is the moment, and I want to encourage you to do that right now. It can happen. We say it's as simple as A, B, C, to admit that you need God's forgiveness, to believe that what Jesus did for you and for me is enough and then to confess it with your mouth. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer that's going to help you to do that right now. If that's you, I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin, my guilt, and my shame, and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to. You rose from the grave to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with the Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Man, I want you to know if you prayed that prayer, if you were reconciled to your heavenly Father today, I want to rejoice with you. Please let us know. Say, I prayed that prayer. Put it in the comments. Put it in the, in the, in the chat. Whatever you want. We want to follow up. You reach out to us by email or, or you can you could just put new life to our church. You could text new life to 312-313-2729. Whatever way you can reach out to us, we want to help you to continue to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. It is my joy today. It's such, been such a great series. I have been enriched and I have enjoyed studying and preparing for this. I hope that you have been enriched by it as well. Let's go ahead and let's remember who our source is today and reflect back to him the praise that he is due. And let's sing it, not to us, but to your name. We lift up all praise. Not to us, but to your name. We lift up Say that again. Not to us, but to your name. We lift up all praise. Not to us, say. Not to us, but to your name. Come on, they
take of your source today. Not to us, say. Not to us, but to your name. our needs I'll shine stars the riches Lord. of his glory in Christ Jesus love is like his unfailing love oh, oh nothing else compares oh. God I pray blessing on your people today I thank you that you know every one of our needs your word says that he who did not spare his own son, but willingly gave him up for us all, how much more will he then graciously give us all things? God, if you have made provision for this costliest of needs in our lives, for, the, for that grace and forgiveness that is ours, God, you're going to take care of those whom you redeemed. And so I pray encouragement and blessing on your people. God, you are able to meet all of our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. God bless you today. Thank you, New City, for being with us. Have a wonderful week.